Hey friends, welcome back to Practical Bible Living, where we are studying the gospel according to John. We are in chapter 10, and we're finishing up here. We're going to wrap it up with chapter 10, verse 40 through 42, and that will complete chapter 10. And now, uh, today's discussion is so important, especially the second half of today's discussion. And it's it should be short, and uh, it really is worth your time. So stick with me here, okay, to the end. I think you're going to find... Uh, just amazing things as we go through. And as we are finishing the last little bit of this chapter here in chapter 10, be sure to have joined us first from the start of the chapter, okay? Or even from the start of the gospel to have a good feel for where we are and how we got here, okay? Now, let's dive right in here at verse 40. And we read the following. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. Okay, so the reference to the Jordan, where the Lord's going back to, to the place where John, that's John the Baptist, okay? And we have to remember that uh, there is John the Baptist, and then there's John, who is the author, the disciple who is the author of this gospel, okay? We have to make sure we distinguish the John that we're speaking or referring to. Now, What we're seeing here, okay? Now, let's read that again. And he went away, okay? And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first. And there he stayed. Now, what we're seeing here, we need to consider. We need to really think about it, okay? Now, I agree with those who point out that there was a period that marked the start of the Lord's ministry. And this is generally when he was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, when he was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan, right? Since that time, okay, since that time, the Lord began to bring about his his ministry publicly, right? Since he was baptized, right, and he was tested in the wilderness, we started to see that his ministry had began and he started traveling through all of Galilee, city to city, preaching uh, the kingdom of God, right? And uh, doing, and performing signs and miracles, teaching uh, all about the kingdom of God. And at that time, okay, at that time, the mention of John the Baptist was prominent. We were reading all about John the Baptist around that time because John the Baptist had a big role in preparing the way for the start of the Lord's ministry, okay? Since that time, okay, since that time, until now, at this point in the gospel, so much has happened within, you know, right around approximately three years or so, okay? Most of which was not recorded in the gospel because, as John, the author of this gospel, indicates later, there's just not enough books to contain all that he did, okay? And so, after all that Jesus did publicly, tugging at the hearts of the crowds everywhere he went, especially in Jerusalem, his time when he would allow himself to be taken by the Pharisees and the high priests was fast approaching. Remember how we kept noting throughout our study that the Pharisees and scribes did not take him, or he has escaped from them. Okay, and it was always because, as it was also written, it was not yet his time, right? And we had said, when it does become his time, we know he gives himself up to them, so that what was written of him would come to pass. But now see where we are here. Okay, now we reach this subtle point in his ministry where we are seeing a hint of change, okay? There's a little bit of a turning point here. Note here that the Lord went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John the Baptist was baptizing at first, okay? This is stated for a reason. We are being reminded purposely of where his journey began, right? Of where this journey began for Jesus. John the author of this gospel, not to be confused with John the Baptist, 
is laying out a kind of timeline in this gospel here by showing us that now, here at this point, the Lord has returned to where he first began his ministry, where John the the Baptist baptized him. And we will see that this is for a reason, and it marks a big transition. Okay? He will transition gradually from this point, okay, from his public ministry to large crowds, okay, to now spending more personal time with his disciples, preparing them for all that was to come. And as we'll see in chapter 11, the final huge miracle that he will perform involves raising Lazarus from the dead. Now, don't get me wrong, he will still speak to crowds. And he'll still heal two blind men on the side of the road. Okay? He'll even curse a tree okay, for showing no fruit, and it will wither away. All right? He'll even restore the ear of the high priest's servant after it's cut off. All right? And he still does things like that. He'll still do those things because his passion and his compassion, right? his passion and compassion has never ceased. Right? But, okay? But what we can certainly note here is that before his own resurrection from the dead, okay, which is the greatest miracle of all, we have seemed here to reach a transition where preparations are starting to be made for his last days on, on the earth. You know, as can see uh, even by uh, when we see Mary, for example, Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, Right, the Lazarus who's raised from the dead, Mary, his sister, will see after Lazarus is raised that Mary begins to anoint the feet of Jesus. And we see Jesus comment that Mary has kept this oil for his burial. You see, a lot of transitioning that's going to happen here. So we see a lot of transitioning happening where the focus now is on the preparations and the final words the Lord has especially for his inner circle, to strengthen them, okay? to teach them the final important things they need to know. And even more so, this becomes a transitional focus in the gospel, according to John, a very transitional focus. Okay. Again, Jesus is not completely out of the public eye. Okay, We'll see him speaking to crowds, Okay, but we see a distinct change at this point where more of his attention is given to his disciples and those close to him. The transition also likely marks a very much needed self-preparation for Jesus. Remember, just take a moment and remember that the Lord Jesus was God the Son, but at the same time, fully man, right? Experiencing emotions and hardships, right? All the emotions that you and I feel. Pain, right? The distress, the anxieties, he feels them. We also know because it's written that he was filled with deep sorrow in his heart over what he knows he is about to suffer and endure. And so, in thinking about all these things, we can see the relevance of our verses here today as this transition here is marked by the Lord returning back to the Jordan where his journey first began, having been baptized by John, right? John the Baptist. Okay? He's returning here, marking a kind of transition toward that final week of his life before he is put to death and, of course, rises from the dead thereafter. So from here on, as we see the great miracle of the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead, okay, which is the next thing to happen, Keep these things in mind because you, who have been journeying with us through the gospel from the beginning, you yourself will begin to feel the change, okay? And the, mo- and, and the change in the focus, and the change in the mood, and the change in the words. Okay? You'll see it and you'll feel it, all right? Now, the, resur- the resurrection of Lazarus in chapter 11 okay, is very purposeful. Okay? And it shifts our focus on resurrection in general. All right? 
the resurrection, which is concerning the Lord's coming resurrection from the dead, and definitely, as we will see, is also all about our resurrection from the dead in the last days. All right. I can't wait till we get into chapter 11 here because, um, you know, we're going to see some really amazing things uh, surrounding what we read. And we'll, we'll jump into chapter 11, God willing, on the next one. But let's look at verse 41 here. Then many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true. See that? See that? The people who lingered behind Jesus followed him after he left to go back to the Jordan. Okay? These people were people who really did spend time thinking things through. Okay? All right? You can see by their words, having recognized that John the Baptist was not a worker of miracles like Jesus was, but John's testimony about Jesus was realized, see? And they acknowledged that all that John said about Jesus back then was true. That's important to understand because even though you and I are not miracle workers, okay, just like John the Baptist wasn't really a miracle worker, look at the impression that is left on the many people because of the testimony, okay? Just about, you know, like the testimony of John the Baptist that lingered in the minds of these people, right? Just like his testimony lingered in their minds, our testimony lingers in the minds of others. John the Baptist planted a seed into their hearts and minds, and it grew and produced fruits within them that we can see here, right? As they themselves reflect on what John said and how it was true. The same happens when we give okay, a testimony, or we testify of the Lord Jesus to others. It shows the importance of the work of testimony here, okay, that is pointing others to the truth of the gospel, of who Jesus Christ is, and how we are truly only saved by believing in him and living for him, okay? Because as we see here, after all that has happened, the things John told them previously was front and center on their minds. Because of their seeing this connection between John the Baptist's testimony and its actual fulfillment in all that they experienced and saw in Jesus, they decided to follow Jesus. They put two and two together and found that Jesus was in fact the door to heaven. And so it's no coincidence that they choose to follow him as a flock of sheep follow their shepherd. The very thing we had just read about recently, right? They allowed themselves to receive that inner sight to see him and that inner hearing to hear the good shepherd's voice. And so they follow him. And don't miss this, okay? Very important, very important point. Just like everyone today, they had to put aside the false doctrines of the Pharisees that they were being indoctrinated with for years years, and they had to walk against the crowd who only kept them from the truth. Okay? Today is the same. People from all different religions of the world, having been indoctrinated with all kinds of false beliefs, having never questioned the truth, right? never searched for the, the real truth, never questioning what they were told, they only need to look to Jesus to see the compassionate and loving God who died for them, the God who actually responds to their prayers, right? Who actually is revealed as the true God, characterized as a God of love. And then they can look to their idols and stories that they were growing up with and see that the false God that they worshipped never spoke to their hearts. The false God that they prayed to wasn't a God of love. It would never do such a thing for them. And the false God that they believed never comforted them. And worse of all, okay, worse of all, the religion and culture surrounding their false God never nurtured them or gave them any sense of peace. You see that? 
and they will open their minds and their hearts for even a moment to reflect and realize that it's very possible that they've been lied to. You see, the blind having led the blind. And when they consider, okay, just like you and I, when they consider and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they will experience something they never felt before. And suddenly, they feel the presence of God, a feeling they never felt before. Suddenly, they will be surprised and filled with both tears and joy, even tears of joy, when they experience the one true God responding to them. God responding to you, right? And revealing himself to you, one way or another. They will fall on their knees acknowledging this amazing revelation, okay? this revelation that occurred in their life that they have found the truth. And my friends, when one finds that truth, okay, that joy, nobody can ever take it away from you. And nothing else matters after that. There's no going back. You see that? After, after you have tasted of the truth and the goodness of the Lord, you will run to Him like you never ran before. I have on many occasions challenged the listener here, the listeners here, to do this thing, to just call on his name in prayer and to ask him, saying, Jesus, are you the Lord, the Son of God, whom God the Father sent into the world to suffer and die for me so that my sins are covered and removed, that they're removed from me, and that I may be saved and live forever in your kingdom? Jesus, can you respond to me? Can you respond to me, Jesus? I want to know the truth. My mind and my heart is open. I set aside aside my stubbornness and my pride, thinking that I knew everything, and I am ready and desiring to know the truth. Please, Jesus, if you are the truth and the way and the life, just like the Bible says, then please show me because I don't want to die a sinner not knowing the truth. And you said in the Bible that you also don't desire the death of a sinner, but that you desire that everyone repents from all their sins and comes to you and believes in you, that you would save them and give them eternal life. So keep your promise with me because I desire it. See, friends, I challenge you. I challenge you again today to make that call. Just bow your head wherever you are, or even raise your head and look up, and just talk to him with sincerity, with all sincerity and with integrity, not as the skeptic who interrogates God, no, 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 but as the humbled and the lost who's searching for the shepherd, right? And I already told you, I know he'll answer you. Okay, friends, this is the last chance because we are living in the last hour. Therefore, there ain't much time left. You won't have this chance again, okay? If you're not aware of the huge transition that's happening in the world around you this very second, then you're blind of the preparations that are being made for that final time called the tribulation, which is a terrible time, like no other in all the history of the world. The prophet said it. Jesus, our Lord, said it. And the apostles wrote about it. You see? And only those who believe and know the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, and follow him will be led out to his safety. Only they will be led out to his safety. While the remaining who rejected the good shepherd who was trying to rescue him, right? All those who rejected the good shepherd who was trying to rescue them. And the rest of the fake church who never really lived for him or heeded his warnings. All will be cast into great tribulation, where their faith will be readily tested. You see, their faith will be really tested at that point. Don't let this day pass without calling upon the Lord. And if you find yourself cast into great tribulation, okay, and the testing of your faith is required of you, then despite all that you are about to endure, 
hold fast to the Lord, repent from your sins, flee quickly from those fake churches and those fake religions who have failed you and misled you and go directly to the Lord Jesus, calling on his name because he's watching over you. And surely he is looking for you. And he's cheering for you, just as a father is looking and cheering for his lost son. Remember the prodigal son? The parable, the story that the Lord Jesus Christ told uh, his, this, all the people there? Just like a father looking and cheering for his lost son to return from his prodigal living, to journey back to his father through that rough, rough road. And surely after that rough, rough road, that son who's returning to his father will see his father with his arms wide open, running toward him, falling on his neck to hug him and kiss him and put on him a robe and clothe him like royalty and holding a feast for him because that son was lost but is now found. So if you fail to hear, heed, if you fail to heed the warnings and prepare yourself now, take heed and be of good cheer, but you repent and keep the faith until the end. Because I know that the Lord is with you. And the second, okay, that second chance, this second chance that Lord gives is his mercy and his love. And because of it, so many will even realize the truth and come running to that truth. You'll see, one way or another. Verse 42, let's jump to 42, and we read the following, okay? And by the way, this is in the context of verse 40 and 41. These folks who followed Jesus back to the Jordan, where it all started for him, okay? They had noticed here in their minds that everything that John the Baptist spoke of about him were true, and they're reminded of this because they are now back where it all started, where John the Baptist was baptizing. Okay? And so we see in verse 42, and many believed in him there. You see that? They believed in him there because, because they remembered the testimony. You see? They remembered the testimony of those who gave a testimony, those who testified of Jesus Christ. They remembered it. They remembered John the Baptist. So many there, you see, many, they followed him, but many believed in him there. Because all that they seen and all that they heard and all the testimony that they recalled from John the Baptist, everything came together in their minds and in their hearts. And there, they believed in him. Okay, and so, I still ask the question of whether they all truly believed, only because, as you know, throughout the gospel, so far, we've read about a lot of people who supposedly believed, okay? Only to find later that the Lord knew their hearts and knew their form of belief, which was empty, void. It was a wrong kind of believing. They had only believed on the miracles that he performed and on the signs which he, they saw with their eyes, but not really believing in him as the Son of God. But when you take away the miracles and the signs, do they still believe? That's important to consider because today so many people, okay, today, they all say they believe in the gospel. So many people today say they believe in the gospel. But really, when you dig down inside of them, you may find that they just believe that a gospel exists and that what they really believe is that the gospel is just some just something that they you know that we have historically and routinely read and that these are just some kind of uh, general uh, texts some general thing that's used as a platform for the religious traditions of today right and uh, and maybe you know something that's the foundation of certain holidays every year right be careful. That's a description of a dead church. Lukewarm Christianity, which is just Christianity by name. You see? They don't live like believers. They just want the title. You know, they just want the holidays. They just want the gatherings. They just want the socializing. 
It's like a club. But the heart of the gospel is not with them. See? For some, it just makes them feel better to at least have the title of being Christian. Or they just want the passive comfort of saying they go to church. Honestly, none of that matters. The Lord who is alive today is searching the minds and the hearts of each individual one of us as he knows who he knows who loves him and who lives for him. Okay? We cannot fool him. And he knows who talks with him daily and who reads his word daily. And he knows who has changed their life to reflect the Bible and not the world around them. See, I do believe, however, that so many of these people we're reading about here, okay, in verse 42, I really do believe that many of them truly did believe. And their hearts were pricked sharply whenever Jesus spoke, whenever they were convicted of their sin by his messages to them, whenever they felt that sudden realization that this Jesus really did come down from heaven. See, these people are a remnant. You know, we use the word remnant quite a bit, especially when we're talking about, I don't know, if we're referring to the biblical remnant of Israel, right? Which refers to those of the nation of Israel in the last days who will eventually be restored to God through faith in Jesus Christ. You see, a flock who will return to God and acknowledge the Good Shepherd. The word remnant refers to a very small amount of something that remains. See? Now, there may have been a lot of something, but only that last bit of it that remains, that's the remnant. There's also, by the way, this remnant of Christians. You know, the remnant church, the true bride of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has made herself ready. Among the many around the world, who are only Christian by title, not being born again, there is a remnant of true believers who truly believe okay, and truly live for the Lord Jesus Christ in these last days. And you can see it by the way they live and by the way they follow the Lord and how they turn away from everything that doesn't line up with his word. But the Lord loves all who believe in him and follow him. Okay, From those who believed at first, to those who believed at the end, he does not show partiality. See? He doesn't show favoritism. Whether you believed him in the beginning or you just come to know the Lord now, he loves us all the same. My brothers and sisters, the Lord loves you just as he loves me. But you have to know and believe his name, Jesus. You have to know and believe who he is the Son of God. You have to know and believe what he has done, that he came down and was tortured and died as a lamb who was sacrificed, that you may be saved and receive eternal life. You have to repent and you have to renounce all that false worship and the false traditions and the false gods and the idolatry that you have been living, Okay, all that stuff you've been living in, knowing with confidence in your heart and in your mind that those things are just demonic. Demonic and come from the enemy, the devil. And you have to run and flee from it. You have to run to the Lord. And He is the one who will save you. And He is the one who will refresh you. Well, friends, God willing, if we are still here, I am surely looking forward to us starting our study in chapter 11. Till then, wishing you all a blessed upcoming weekend. God bless.